Good morning, church, on this All Saints Sunday. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. All right, get your Bibles out, and I'll wait. Go ahead, push pause if you need to. Come back, but bring your Bible. If you haven't been following this preaching series and maybe doing a little bit of independent study on your own, then shame on you, really, because this is a fascinating book of the Bible. It is as epic as Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It has political intrigue, true history, suspense, monsters, prophecy, murders, and a great hero figure. But above all, the promise of a sovereign and loving God. So while you're turning to Daniel 8 in your Bibles, let's begin with prayer. Father, we come to you again this morning with our Bibles open before us, praying that you would enlighten us and fill our hearts with a sense of your glory. May your word continue to transform us more and more into the image of your Son, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. My mom once told me, son, follow your dreams. <laughs> so I went back to bed. And that's kind of what happens in our text this morning. Daniel has a vision, so it's not really a dream, but he has a vision and takes to his bed. Look at verse 27. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. And then I rose and went about the king's business. You know, I don't ever title my sermons, but if I did, this one would be called The Ram, The Goat, and the little horn. Doesn't that sound like a C.S. Lewis novel? The ram, the goat, and the little horn. And we're going to be looking at about 389 years of world history here this morning. So buckle up, because it's about to get wicked fast. Now, historically speaking, in about 13 years from the time of Daniel's vision here in Daniel 8, the Persian Empire, under the rule of Cyrus the Great, would come barreling down upon Belshazzar and overthrow the Babylonians, establishing the greatest power that the world had ever known. Its kingdom would eventually extend from Egypt in the south and southern Europe in the north all the way to the borders of India. This is the kingdom that Daniel sees represented by the ram with two horns. Verse 3. How do I know that? Well, verse 20 tells me. As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. The larger horn is symbolic of Persia because we know that Cyrus united the Median and Persian empires before conquering Babylon. Now, the interesting thing is that when Cyrus came upon the scene, he actually began to release the Jews from their captivity in Babylon and even sponsored the rebuilding of the temple. And you can read Ezra and Nehemiah for that story. But Cyrus was pretty sure of himself. He was pretty narcissistic, which I guess you would have to be to be a ruler in that age. At the end of Second Chronicles, and again at the beginning of Ezra, he is recorded as saying, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, thankfully, we know that's not true, that it is, always has been, and forevermore will be Jesus, to whom God has given all the kingdoms of the earth. All right, so that's the first thing we see, the ram with two horns. What happens next? Verses 5 through 7. Daniel tells us that uh, as he was pondering the ram, Behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes, and the ram had no power to stand before him, and the goat trampled him to the earth. Now, if you know your history, this one should be pretty easy for you. But even if you slept through history in high school or in college, don't worry, because verse 21 explains that the goat is the king of Greece. Historically, about 200 years after Cyrus and his Persians 
conquered Babylon, they themselves would be conquered by a little guy named Alexander the Great. And he did this in an incredibly short period of time with utter domination, which would explain how the goat was able to race across the whole earth without touching the ground. So in our story, the ram, the goat, and the little horn, we've briefly been introduced to the ram and the goat. But Daniel's vision doesn't stop there. Verse 8 tells us that when the goat had become strong, the great horn was broken and four conspicuous horns came up in its place. Alexander the Great was said to have conquered the whole world by the time he was 26 years old, but by age 33 he lay dead from a mysterious disease. And after his death, his kingdom was divided into four parts, each ruled by one of his generals. You know, pastor and scholar, Reverend Dr. Ian Duguid writes, these empires that to human eyes look so powerful seem to have no weakness or chinks in their armor were actually merely sheep and goats whose destiny lay in the hands of the divine shepherd, the Lord himself. Daniel's vision continues in verse 9. Out, out of one of the four horns came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars of heaven were tossed to the ground and trampled. This little horn will throw truth to the ground, and it will act, and it will prosper. Verse 24 begins to tell us that his power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and destroy mighty men of the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. Doesn't that sound like today? And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And if we turn briefly to the first chapter of First Maccabees in the Apocrypha, we found that Antiochus IV, the little horn of Daniel 8, sent a contingent of soldiers to Jerusalem to pretend to make friends with the Jewish people. And when he began in his deceitful way to make friends with the Jews, the soldiers seized control of the temple, just as Daniel said would happen. In verse 25, and when the Jews resisted him, began severe persecutions against him. Time of the indignation and wrath had arrived as prophesied by Daniel 350 years before. We know from the record of history that Antiochus IV set himself up to be God in place of the prince of princes. In fact, he called himself Epiphanes, meaning the manifest God. He put this phrase on all of the coins of the empire, Antiochus, the manifest God. Daniel wrote in verse 12 that truth was thrown to the ground, and Antiochus fulfilled this by burning the Torah scrolls. Any books of the law that they found, they tore to the pieces and burned with fire. And anyone possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the law was condemned to death by decree of the king, he gave orders to force the Jews to stop regular sacrifices. He desecrated the temple by placing the statue of Zeus in front of the altar, and he ordered that people offer pigs as a sacrifice to this heathen god. The blood of pigs was splashed on the sacred altar. And if they refused to worship him, they were just simply put to death. The temple doors were closed. The high priest, Onias III, was assassinated in 170 B.C. And by 167 B.C., the sacrifices of the Jews were prohibited. The Jews could no longer worship in the temple. <coughs> you may have heard the phrase, the abomination of desolation, and maybe wondered what it meant. This is where it comes from, here in Daniel. 
and with more detail in 1st Maccabees chapter 1 verses 20 through 64. In Daniel 8 one angel asked another how long the transgression that makes desolate will last. Daniel 9 tells of the prince who is to come who shall make sacrifice and offering cease and in their place shall be an abomination that desolates. Daniel 11 tells the history of the arrogant foreign king who sets up the abomination that makes desolate. And in Daniel 12, the prophet is told how many days will pass from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that desolates is set up. Well, with the temple closed, many of the Jewish people fled from Jerusalem and they went out into the wilderness. Soon there was a, a rebel alliance living in the desert. Does that sound like Star Wars or what? One man rose to leadership and he had five Jedi sons, the five sons of Maccabee, taken from the Hebrew word meaning hammer. <laughs> The nine-year-old me wants that name right there. And y'all can just start calling me Mike Hammer. They started guerrilla raids in Jerusalem, attempting to win back control of the temple. And history records that in 164, the high priesthood was re-consecrated. Antiochus IV went insane and died. Three years after the temple was closed, it was reopened by these Maccabean freedom fighters. According to 1 Maccabees chapter 4 verse 52, they reinstated the sacrifice on the 25th day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev, in the year 165 BC. That's how it ended back then. The Maccabee brothers stormed the temple and they, when they got into the temple and restored it, they celebrated with a festival. And during that festival, they lit a lamp, and so they called this feast the Feast of Lights, or in the Hebrew, Hanukkah. This is referenced in John chapter 10, when Jesus went up to Jerusalem to celebrate Hanukkah, the winter festival. Hanukkah celebrates the historical account of the priests lighting the candle in the temple after it was reconsecrated. The candle was only supposed to last for one day, but this time it burned for eight days. Now, well, was this just a legend, or did God truly intervene? You know, Jesus fed 5,000 men, plus their wives and children, with five loaves and two small fish. He fed 4,000 plus with some fries and a few chicken McNuggets. Was this simply creative portioning? Or did God once again provide for his people when they were in need? I know what I need. I know what I believe. It reminds me of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a few chapters ago. You remember what they said, O oh, king, we're not going to fall down before you. Our God will deliver us. And if not, pastor and author R. Kent Hughes tells the story of a a tropical storm that stalled over Guam back in the 80s and sustained winds over 200 miles per hour meant that power was out over the whole island. And like everyone else, the radio station run by missionaries had lost power too, but they, they had a backup generator. As you know, in a natural disaster, a, the radio can be a lifeline. Well, the radio host announced that the generator held only enough gas to last about eight, or I'm sorry, about five hours. But you know what? That radio station stayed on the air for 13 hours. Maybe that's what happened to those candles when the Temple of Jerusalem was reconsecrated. Whatever the case, this is why Hanukkah is celebrated with an eight candle menorah. It's an eight day festival that Jesus himself celebrated. To this day, Hanukkah is celebrated on, on the 25th day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev, or our month of December. We have a wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. God restored the temple and God restored his people. 
And that same God, if he is your heavenly father, can and will take care of you. He is our king and he will overthrow his enemies. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, how does Christ execute the office of king? And the answer is, Christ executes the office of a king by subduing us to himself and by ruling and defending us and in conquering all his and our enemies. Do you believe that? It's the Lord who sets up kingdoms and the Lord who tears down kingdoms and nothing falls outside of God's providence. That's the message we hear in Daniel. That's the message in the story of the ram, the goat, and the little horn. The Lord sets up kingdoms, and the Lord tears down kingdoms, but the kingdom of God will last forever. And if this is the encouragement that we are meant to take away from this wild history, there's also an implied warning, best summarized, I think, in Psalm 146, verses 3 to 4. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. My dear friends, when we encounter hostility against God and his people, in whatever form or fashion that might take, the temptation, I think, might be to give in as we find ourselves on the wrong side of history. But what Daniel reminds us in this vision is that the kingdoms of this world are perishable. And so put your trust in him alone. The Babylonian Empire, gone. The Medo-Persian Empire, gone. The Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, gone. The Seleucid Empire of the Little Horn, Antiochus IV, gone. The Roman Empire, gone. And the list goes on and on. And Dean Lane talked about this last week. We don't put our trust in perishable kingdoms that don't last, nor in cultural movements or trends that are bound to fade. The only way for us to ever be on the wrong side of history would be for us not to align ourselves through faith in Christ alone with the God who controls all history. Now, I've saved the best bit for last, not because I forgot it, but because I wanted you to take note of it. And so you realize now that I'm coming to the end of my sermon, so you're sitting up straight pretending like you're listening after this whirlwind tour of world history. Now, this morning in our service, uh, Mike Laverde actually read the Daniel passage, and he did a beautiful job with it. But he stopped halfway at verse 15. And so I'd like to finish where he left off. If you look at the second half of verse 15. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. The first time an angel is mentioned by name in the Bible, and it's Gabriel, the one who would announce the good news to Zechariah and the Virgin Mary of the births of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. How cool is that? And just who was with this one? having the appearance of a man, standing on the banks of the Uli, telling Gabriel to explain the vision to Daniel? I think you know the answer to that one, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns over all the kingdoms of the earth, the one who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He promised that he would be with us even to the end of the age. My dear friends, don't give up on your dreams. Go back to sleep. God is in control. And for those of us who've skipped ahead to the end of the book, we know that in the end, 
God wins, game over. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all dominion, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen.